All right. Well, thanks for coming. We're going to talk about uh, programming paradigms. Uh, first question, how many of you are programmers? Awesome. I'm in the right place. Excellent. So uh, what kind of, what languages do you program in? Uh, throw out a few names for me. Java, I heard. Did I, see, did I hear C sharp? All right. What else? JavaScript. <laughs> what else? A uh, Python. C, C, C++. I like JavaScript guy now. What else? Uh, Haskell? Pascal? <laughs> Welcome to 1950. <laughs> Did I hear Haskell or Pascal? Haskell, thank you. Okay, Haskell. <laughs> um, all right, so that's good enough. Let's get started. Well, we're going to talk about programming paradigms, but let's talk with the, uh, start with the question. Hey, what, what happened to that? Okay, so let's start with the question, uh, who are we? And uh, when we ask that question, who we are, you know, we could answer the question. We could say we are programmers, coders, computer scientists, architects, data scientists. All of these are things we normally hear people say. But what are we really? Well, if we can get that working, actually. Uh, what are we really? Um, kind of like aliens are attacking, isn't it? Just kind of comes and goes. <laughs> okay. So the question really is, I'm going to say we're not any of those. What we really are is we are problem solvers. That's what we really are. Every day we go to work, we uh, solve problems, and we work on fixing things. That's what we do. I know what you're thinking. Okay, I'll agree to that. Some of us create more problems than we fix. But nevertheless, we're still problem solvers. That's what we do. And in the scheme of solving problems, programming languages play a small role in it. It's part of that puzzle. And maybe a small part sometimes. But I'm a big fan of programming languages. I started programming about 35 years ago. And I still program every single day. I program in about 15 different languages. What I'm telling you in so many words is I'm not good in any one of them. But I love programming. And I enjoy programming. And what I really enjoy in programming is the ability to look at a problem, come up with algorithms, solutions, and write code, and then rewrite it and refactor it. And programming plays a very small role in that whole puzzle, but nevertheless is a big part of what I do. And languages play a role in the programming. But what are languages really? Well, this is one thing that I would say sets us, the humans, apart from animals, is the languages we speak, the natural languages. And languages are really a great tool for our communication. That's what we use languages for, is to communicate. And humans have the ability to create languages and the grammars and the sem uh, uh, semantics of what we do, and we use that to communicate. Well, programming languages like natural languages are exactly for that purpose. We use it to communicate. Often we think through computers, but really to fellow human beings. And what really excites me about programming languages, though, is not just it's a communication tool, but it's a form of expression. And if you really uh, think about it, that's one of the key things about programming languages is the form of expression. You know, I started programming for the math and science in programming. But after decades, I'm still a programmer, not because of that, but it's because of the art in programming. And in a way, if you really think about it, you could ask somebody to write a poem. You could ask them to write a poem about love or some other situation. But we could write pretty much the same topic, but infinite number of poems. In a similar way, the code we write can be written in so many different ways. Some terrible, some really beautiful, some very expressive. And the form of expression of programming languages makes a, a huge difference when it comes to how we can express our ideas and thoughts. But of course, if you ask about programming languages, most people will tell you that almost all the languages out there that we use are Turing complete. And yes, that's great. But unfortunately, Turing completeness is a very low bar in my opinion. And the reason is Turing completeness doesn't talk about a lot of other things. For example, how easy it is to maintain code, we don't talk about it. So saying that a language is Turing complete is kind of like saying that humans can sing. But that doesn't mean you want most humans to sing. 
Trust me, you don't want me to be sing, singing on the stage right now. But the point really is that a lot of other questions really arise. For example, what about ease of use? What about elegance of the programming language? What about performance? What about various other things like efficiency and maintainability of code? A lot of those things are not answered by just saying the language is Turing complete. And we need to really focus on those for effectively using languages as well. But programming languages come in different flavors. And this is one of the things that really becomes exciting when it comes to languages. Languages have semantics and languages have syntax. But a lot of times people focus on the syntax of the language, but I'm keenly interested in the semantics of the language because that's where the real fun is. Syntax is what you see with your eyes, semantics is what's behind it. And we need to really understand that as well. But one of the ways to think about languages is we can think about typing of the languages. Oftentimes people talk about static type languages. And then people talk about dynamic type languages. And of course, there are so many languages that fit into these categories. But I would like to look at languages in four quadrants rather than just one or the other. For example, what about strong typing versus weak typing? And don't get me wrong, I love programming languages. I love them all. And part of the reason I make fun of languages is because I love them. In fact, um, one of my most recent book was on JavaScript. I love JavaScript, and yet I love making fun of it. And when it comes to these languages, we can't just look at static versus dynamic. So static versus dynamic is what happens when you write the code. Like example, if a language requires compilation of the code versus languages that don't. Well, in the case of static typing, you specify the type when you write the code or the type is inferred when you write the code and it gets compiled. In a dynamic type language, the type sanity is not enforced at code writing time. On the other hand, strong versus weak is referring to what happens when you execute the code. Does the runtime validate the type sanity? And in that regard, if you think about language like Java, for example, language like Java we all know is static typing. The word static is missing up there if you, uh, in, in the green bar. But, but you can ask the question, is it static? Uh, is Java, Java is statically typed, we know that. But when you run the code, hopefully not too often, but occasionally, you get the exception of a class, in, uh, 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 in, in, invalid cast of a ca class, and you get an exception similar to that. And so when you get a class cast exception, where does it come, come from? Well, that's coming from the runtime telling you that it's not really valid type. So Java is statically typed, but it's also strongly typed language as well. On the other hand, take a look at an example like C++. Anyone who programs in C++ here? Uh, I, I can see the hands kind of reluctantly going up. It's okay, you're among friends. And for some reason, they're all on this side. I'm not sure why. But, I mean, I spent 15 years of my life programming in C++. I love the language. And it's an extremely powerful language. But C++ is a statically typed language. We know that. When you compile the code, the type information is validated. But what if you cast away? What if you cast to something that is not correct? Well, C++ will run and do whatever it wants to do. And whatever the V table has, it's going to be the result of it. And if you don't believe me, just look at any one of the people who raised the hand for saying that they are C++ programmers and see them in the morning. They're always excited to go to work because they have no clue what the code is going to do when they get to work. And, and that's basically the weekly type language. So you can see that it's static type, but it's also weekly type language. On the other hand, take a look at languages like Python or Ruby. Well, we know that these languages are dynamically typed. You don't specify the type when you write the code. There's no compiler to verify it. But however, at runtime, you will get errors if you're dealing with the wrong type because there's a runtime that is checking for type sanity. So languages like Ruby and Python and Smalltalk, these languages are dynamically typed, but these are, those are also strongly typed languages. Of course, no talk will be complete without mentioning the best language humans have ever created, <laughs> JavaScript. And when, when it comes to JavaScript, how does that work? Well, we know JavaScript is dynamically typed, but what happens when you run the code? It's a miracle. And when it runs the code, it does whatever it wants to do. And so JavaScript is dynamically typed, but it's also weakly typed. I don't know who said this, but on Twitter I saw this message. Somebody said brilliantly. He said, 
JavaScript is weakly typed because every week I wonder what the code is doing. <laughs> and, and that is an example of what a weak type language is. But I love JavaScript. I program in it. Don't get me wrong. I love the language. But it also, it's a love-hate relationship. I love it when it works. And when it doesn't work, uh, it's cruel. And I was struggling with JavaScript the other day. I had written some code, and it was not quite working. It was misbehaving. And so out of frustration, I tweeted this message. And I truly meant it when I wrote it. And here's my analysis of how JavaScript is, or programming JavaScript is. JavaScript is like an infant. It is cute to play with, but you have no clue why when it begins to cry. <laughs> and this is the way I feel about JavaScript a lot of times. And it's like you call mom and say, Mom, the kid is crying. What happened? And mom says, have you checked the diaper? Yes, I did. Have you fed the baby? Yes. Is there any insect nearby? And you're just debugging one step at a time, trying to figure out why this doesn't work. And this is something that can be a little frustrating at times, but that's just the nature of these languages. Very powerful. But if you really think about it, the World Wide Web is run by JavaScript. The servers are run by C implementations, one sort or of the other. Almost every language compiles to it. So in the end, the whole world is running on weak typing, which is kind of scary if you really think about it. And yet we celebrate all these different semantics. <coughs> Pardon me. You mentioned about a few different languages here. Let's see what those things meant, and, and how does this really pan out? So if we were to take a look at the languages you mentioned here, well, you can notice that you have Java, C Sharp, and Haskell, which are static typing and strong typing. That's what you mentioned. You have C Sharp, uh, C++, you mentioned that. It's weak typing and static typing. You mentioned Python, which is strong and dynamic. And of course, you mentioned JavaScript, which is the weak and dynamic on the other side. So that gives us an idea about how these languages kind of map over this. So it's not a point in, in, in time or space. It is actually a spectrum, and you can be in one of those four quadrants. But when it comes to this, there are several different programming paradigms that are out there. And these things intrigue me. There is procedural programming. There is structured programming. There is object-oriented programming, functional, not to mention other things that are not listed here. But in the procedural programming, of course, we write procedures. And we write routines and subroutines. But that led to the wilderness of using go-tos everywhere. The most phenomenal paper that um, Edgar Dijkstra wrote, where he said go-to is evil. And if you really think about it, that makes a lot of sense, because what does go-to really mean? Well, think about this for a minute. Here's a beautiful room. There are doors to this room. It's perfectly natural if somebody opens a door and comes in, or somebody gets up and walks through one of those doors. That makes sense. But what if you're sitting here, and suddenly somebody appears next to you? You're going to freak out. Well, that's what go-to is. Because go-to says, ta-da, I'm here. And you're like, what, what the hell? Where did you come from? And there's no context, and just bolts into the middle of a function. That's what go-to does. And Dijkstra said, there's no way to stay sane if we use go-to, don't do it. And so that's basically what structured programming is. Structured programming is a refinement of procedural programming where we have clear entry point and clear exit points. But then, of course, we took that further and said, what if we model data and encapsulate data and put behavior around it? We got object oriented programming. But obviously, the question is, when you have these different paradigms, are they all so disjoint from each other? Well, this is one of the luxuries that I have for myself, is I get to waste two, three, four days of my life whenever I want to, and sit in the corner, not talk to anybody, but think about it. And one of the realizations I came across is that these are not entirely different. There is a common thread. And to me, that one common thread, there may be more than one, but one is I was thinking about how do we solve problems. And if we were to give an award for somebody in our field, I would argue that award should go to this one guy whose name is David Wheeler. Because David Wheeler said something that is probably the most fundamental and phenomenal, something that affects what we do every single day. And here's what David Wheeler said. He said in computer science, we can solve any problem by introducing another level of indirection. And, and to me, this is the most profound statement ever, in my opinion. And the reason is, we solve problems all the time by using a level of indirection. If you don't know how to solve a problem, solve a problem that in turn will solve the problem for you. And we can keep using this level of indirection over and over and over. It is such a very fundamental way in which we approach problems. And then I got thinking, if this is really so fundamental, 
then it doesn't matter what the programming paradigm is, we should in fact have a level of interaction in it, isn't it? And so I started thinking about what is the level of interaction in procedural programming? Well, in procedural programming, the level of interaction comes from pointers. Because pointers point to either functions or objects, and you are our structures, and you are able to change the pointer and execute a completely different function. And this is so fundamental in languages like C, for example. In fact, this is so fundamental that we use pointers everywhere. I know some of you may be thinking, you may think, wait a minute, I program in Java. Well, that is the beauty of Java. When Java was introduced, the most popular language was C++. And C++ programmers hated pointers. And if you ever look at a C++ programmer, you will know who they are because they have scars on their body with all these pointers. You can come close to me and you can see I have a scar on my face that came from one of the pointers uh, that I mishandled one of the days. And, and so when they introduced Java, they said, oh my gosh, if we use pointers, it will never win because all these programmers who hate pointers will not make the transition. These guys are very, very, very smart. They introduced pointers in Java, but they called it references. So everybody was happy the next day. Hey, do you have pointers? No, we have references. That's awesome. We can handle it. Well, what Java did was, Java has pointers everywhere. They just call references. They just don't have pointer arithmetic. And pointer arithmetic adds another level of complexity, but pointers are extremely useful. So pointers give you that level of indirection. Well, then that begs the question, if level of indirection is so important, there's got to be one in object-oriented programming too. And it turns out there is, in object-oriented programming, we have polymorphism. And polymorphism is the level of indirection. Polymorphism says, go ahead and call a method, but the method you call is not based on the type of the reference, but it's based on the type of the object at runtime. So as a result, you are able to use the same reference, but vary the object you refer to at runtime, and you're able to get extensibility. So this is such a very important feature for extensibility in object programming, and we get indirection through polymorphism. Well, then that brings the question, there's got to be a level of indirection in functional programming too. And there is actually. And, and how is that giving us the ability to vary the implementations? Well, think about it this way. Imagine I give you an apple, not the computer, but a fruit. And there are four things you can do with an apple. Maybe you're hungry, you'll eat the apple as soon as they give it to you. Or maybe you'll save it for later and say, I'll eat the apple late in the evening. Or you may give the apple to the person next to you. Or you may just throw it in the trash can. In a similar way, what if I give you a lambda expression? Well, you may execute the lambda right away, or you may execute it later on, or you may pass it to somebody else, some other function, or you may throw it away, lazy evaluation. So you don't have to evaluate a lambda expression right away. You could execute it now, you could execute it later, execute it never, or you can pass it along. So it turns out that lambdas give you a level of indirection in functional programming. So this concept of indirection is so pervasive that we tend to really see this across paradigms, and that becomes a very powerful way of expressing our ideas, expressing our concepts and, and, and ideas uh, in programming. Well, that brings the question, if we have these paradigms, how do we really compare and choose and see which one is more effective? And I believe there's a misguided conversation in here. And the misguided conversation is object-oriented programming versus functional programming. I've got some really good friends who believe in this. And I don't agree with them at all. We still meet we, for dinner. We just agree not to talk about this. And I think that this is a very poor conversation because your enemy is not object-oriented programming. I don't like to throw the baby with the bathwater bath out, uh, out. It's important to know that there's value to object-oriented programming when used correctly. But the real conversation we need to have is imperative versus declarative style of programming. Because that is really where the distinction is. Versus imperative style versus a declarative style, what is the difference? Not even functional. And to me, imperative style of programming is where you tell what to do, and you also have to tell how to do it. And that is exactly what you do in imperative style of programming, is you get immer immersed into not just the what, but also the how of the details. Let's take a look at an example of this, just to get a feel for it. Imagine for a minute we have a list of strings We'll call it names is equal to, let's say list of, let's give it some names over here uh, that is given to us. What I want to do is to find if our list contains our good friend Nemo. 
How would you write code in the imperative style for it? You're going to say Boolean found is equal to false to begin with. Then you say if found, you may output right in here something along the lines of, you know, something like Nemo uh, found, if you will. What if, if found is true, uh, false? You may output something like Nemo not found and maybe play a sad music. But how do you really compute the found? You would start writing code for this. You would say string. Name comes from names, of course, as the collection. This is Java code, clearly. And then what do I do in here? If name, oh, you better not put two equals, or three for that matter. And instead, you have to say dot equals, and that's a decision you have to make and say this is Nemo. And then you would say, in this case, found is equal to true. As an observer reader, you, observant reader, you say, oh, Venkat, you're not done. You better put the break. And if you don't put the break, it'll either give you a wrong result or a poor performance or one or the other. Well, of course, when you write the code like this, this is the imperative style of programming. And when you run the code, it says Nemo found. However, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, come on. I never name variables like this. I call this F or T, or temp. And I fully understand why you do this. Because you're telling the variable you don't deserve to live. And that's what you're saying. These variables are called garbage variables. These garbage variables exist not because the problem demands it. It's because your solution requires that. And that's how we feel about it. And that's an example of an imperative style code. I won't ask you the question, have you ever written code like this? Because almost everybody in the room has written code like this. But I'll ask you a different question. How do you feel when you write code like this? I'll tell you how you feel. You feel dirty. You feel absolutely dirty when you write code like this for eight hours a day. You go home, the children come running towards you. You say, don't touch me. I got to go shower first before I come into the room. That's the way you feel about it. And when you write code like this, it drags you in and beats you down because you have to spend all your time and effort writing all the details you have to write, not just focus on the problem. And that is exactly what an imperative style of programming is. On the other hand, a declarative style of programming is where you tell what and not how. You can keep your focus on the problem, not get dragged into the implementation. For example, if you take this code again, let's comment all that out. And let's just get to the essence of this. Just grab the last part from here. And what I'm going to do here is simply say, in this case, if. And I want to say, instead of found, I'll simply say names.contains Nemo. And I can simply write the code with all that fluff gone away. It still produces the same result. But of course, if you look at this code, that's imperative to declarative style of programming. Of course, I may ask the question, what does, how does contains work? Some of you may say, oh, contains, it simply does what you saw up here. That's a really good answer. Or you may say, oh, no, contains is very efficient. It uses some kind of a magic or a hash code and gives you really good performance. That's also a good answer. Maybe there's a third answer, and you try. How about, I don't care? <laughs> OK, that's a little rude. Let's try this again. It's encapsulated. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't care. <laughs> well, but there's a difference, though. As programmers, we know we care. But there's one big difference. The imperative style code never gave you a chance, never gave you a choice. It said, here's the detail on your face all the time. The, the declarative code says, it's right behind one layer. You can click on it and take a look at it, but I'm not going to put that on your face every single time. So you can ease into it when you need it, but you're not forced into it. And as a result, it reduces the complexity of what we have to do. So in other words, the imperative code has accidental complexity. The declarative code hides that complexity behind one layer. But of course, that begs the question, if that's what it is, where in the world is functional style of programming? And that's what excites me about functional style of programming. And there is functional style is declarative plus the use of higher order functions. So you're able to build nicely on the declarative style in order to achieve the functional style of programming. And every single functional style is also declarative. And part of the reasons why we get the benefit of programming functional style is the fact that it's declarative as well. So the essence of functional style of programming is it's built on declarative, and we use higher order functions. But we build it upon using the function composition, and we also leverage the lazy evaluations as well. 
We'll talk about that a little bit later. But when it comes to this, of course, in the case of imperative style of programming, I'm going to say imperative style is easy to write, but really hard to read. Why is it easy to write? Part of the reason it's easy to write is, this is what we've been doing for a long, long time. Unfortunately, most schools teach us imperative style of programming to begin with. And of course, we program, once we get to the industry, that is the mainstream. And we program an imperative style a lot. And because we've been taught this, and because we do this a lot, it becomes a lot easier for us to work with it. On the other hand, imperative style becomes really hard to read as time goes on. And it, it, it really is something, you know, you will see people say words like this, let me figure out what the code is doing. What they're saying is, I don't have a clue, I got to really think deeply to figure out what's going on with this code, and that becomes really hard as time goes on. Now, on the other hand, if you think about uh, uh, the functional style of programming, what does that tell you? A functional style of programming, I'm going to argue, is easier to read but is hard to write. And partly that's because of unfamiliarity to the functional style of programming. A lot of us have done imperative style programming a lot. And functional programming style is maybe relatively new for a lot of us. I mean, I came from the background of programming in imperative style. I spent a few decades programming in imperative style. When I started learning about functional style of programming, it was a different mindset. Rather than taking the data and mutating it, I had to think about transformation of data and composition of functions. What made it even worse is when I was trying to really understand functional programming, the people who were programming in functional style came to me and said, oh, functional programming, it's really easy. I'm like, no, it's not. Because it really had me think very differently, and that transition was not an easy journey at all. It took a lot of effort to do this. But functional style is easy to read, but can be hard to write. But we read code more often than write it. So as a result, it's good that it's actually easy to read. But on the other hand, the imperative style can get progressively worse. Let's take a look at an example just to see how worse it could possibly become. So let's take this code again. But this time, in, this correct, in the list we have, let's change the problem we want to handle just a little bit. I'm going to say print, comma separated, let's say, uh, the names... Uh, in uppercase, of length 4. Well, that's not rocket science. That's a very simple problem. And a simple problem should have a simple solution, isn't it? So let's give it a try. So far, I'm going to say string name comes from names. Hey, that's not too bad. And what am I going to do? Output. Well, first of all, I'm going to say if name.length is equal to 4. Great. I've got all the names that are length 4. What do I do then? Output the name, but in uppercase. So I could say, implement and output the name in uppercase. But the problem says, they should be comma separated. There you go. But of course, we know what comma separated means, that they all have to be on the same line. And so I implement it, and there you have it. But of course, when you run the code, you notice one thing. There's a stupid comma in the very end. Has anyone seen this problem before? <laughs> How did you feel? When you ran into that, you said, this is not happening to me. <laughs> because how do I get rid of that comma? And you thought about it for a few minutes and said, that's easy. I can just remove it. Oh, damn it. String is immutable. And then you spend a little bit more time. And then you say, hey, I'll use a string builder. And your colleague says, or a string buffer. Now you're debating which is better. <laughs> and how do you really remove this still? And as you're debating this, you realize, you know what? It's not really that hard. There's a way to actually fix it. You just don't put comma for the last element. That's it. Why didn't we think of it? So let's do that. Don't put comma for the last element. How do you know it's the last element? Oh, very simple. All you do is int i equal to zero. <laughs> yeah, how do you feel? 20 minutes later, you're still trying to figure this out. In the meantime, the boss is like, how's it going? Are you done yet? You want to strangle them, isn't it? You're like, I couldn't get this code to work properly. Why? Hey, it's a simple problem. Yeah, why don't you try? <laughs> well, the point is, imperative style can drag you and beat you down. And this is really annoying if it happens. Let's see if we can do this in the functional style, if you will. So we could bring in the collectors API. In this, in this case, we are using Java. So I can say output 
Names.stream. Stream is an internal iterator. You can say filter, given a name. I want to say name.length is equal to 4. So we have all the people whose oh, names which are of length 4. We can perform a map and say string to uppercase. We can convert it to an uppercase. And then we can do a collect. And we can say joining using a comma. So we can simply write the code using a functional pipeline. And of course, when we run the code, there's no stupid comma in the end. And the code begins to read like the problem statement, as we can see. So in other words, we have removed the accidental complexity in the code. We are simply saying, given all the names, get me the names which are of length 4, convert to uppercase, and, and collect them all into a string using a comma as a separator. So you can see how the code becomes a lot easier to work with. Now, clearly, functional style is better. We should all be programming in that, isn't it? Well, unfortunately, life is not that simple. I've been wrong. I've been wrong so many times, so many ways, in so many different degrees. And I used to once program in imperative style that was absolutely phenomenal. That's what I was doing because I didn't know any better. Then once I, exposed, well, I was exposed to functional style, I went all the way to the other extreme and said, oh my gosh, functional style is the best way to do. Why would anybody program in imperative style? I've come a full circle now. And there are reasons for that. And one of them is, programming style should be imperative or functional. Well, the answer to that question can be a little complex, but I want to go back to about 100 years and look at something even more exciting than this, is physics. And there were scientists pr uh, working on this, and they were trying to understand light. There were people like Einstein and Planck. And first they did experiments, and they said, oh, look, light, it's a particle. And that was true until they found out it was not entirely true because it exhibited behavior that cannot be defined with particles. And so then they said, oh, light has to be a wave. And it was true, and except it was not because it exhibited behaviors that was not true of a wave also. And we know now today what that is called. Is light a particle or a wave? And the answer is we have the wave-particle duality. I know it's not as exciting as that one in our field, but I'm going to say that in our field we have a very similar problem. And that is, I'm going to call it as an imperative functional duality. And it is, code is neither imperative nor functional all the time. And, and trying to force ourselves to be one or the other, I believe is a disservice to what we do. Because these to me are tools. And by being able to use the right tool to solve the problem, we gain the strength, the power is in us to be able to use and diversify and mix and match where it makes sense. By saying that one is only way better way to do than the other, we are pretty much limiting what we do. Because there are times when one is a better solution than the other, hands down, and we cannot dispute that, unfortunately. For example, imperative style is really good for dealing with side effects and exceptions. Well, unfortunately, though, it's really impossible for a lot of us, especially working with legacy code, to throw away side effects. Side effects is the way of life for us. And we have to really deal with side effects. What if somebody tells you, I want you to write a piece of code in Java where there's absolutely no side effect? Can you ever do it? I think we can, actually, if you're really determined to do it. I'll show you one. Here's an example of a Java code with absolutely no side effect. It doesn't do anything also. But that's a, besides the point. But practically, it's really hard to write any meaningful code to be able to do that, unfortunately. So side effect is what we deal with, and exceptions. How do you deal with exceptions in functional programming? Well, exception handling is an imperative idea, imperative concept. In functional programming, we don't throw exceptions. Language like Haskell and Scala are working around those details, and they give you a monadic form of handling with that. But unfortunately, though, I, I would claim that those pieces of code become a little convoluted. It's hard to really reason at that point because exceptions muddy the code in the functional style quite a bit. And as, as a result, your code becomes less cohesive. And when the code becomes less, less cohesive, it becomes more complex. And you begin to lose the benefits of functional style programming when you do, deal with uh, side effects and exceptions like that. On the other hand, functional programming is really good for dealing with scale to parallelize your code and to reason with your code as long as you're able to write pure functions. And places where I can write pure functions, I think we should as, as much as possible, I would say functional programming makes a lot of sense. 
But in places where we do have to deal with exceptions, I don't want to force myself to use the functional style and suffer with it. So the capabilities of modern language is a testament to it. If you look at a lot of different languages, Scala, uh, 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 um, if you look at Kotlin, and uh, various other languages, C Sharp, Java, and Smalltalk, and Ruby, and Python, a lot of these languages are mixed paradigm languages. And there's a fairly good reason for that, because these languages don't force you to implement one way or the other, and they give you a choice. And I like to be treated as an adult, where I'm given a choice, and I can make the right choice based on the context, rather than being told this is the only way you should do things. I'm going to say one of the key things about programming in this structure is the following. If you think about this code we just wrote for a minute ago, you can see that in this case we have a functional style of programming. I could have written this code using imperative style as well, the, the, suf the suffering through the variable, the, the i equal to zero. And if I took all the time to write that code, and let's say this is a very large collection, or maybe you're dealing with a large amount of data, and you write the code sequential in the imperative style, let's say. So if you wrote the code imperative and sequential, what is the benefit of that? Well, the first question, the benefit is, a sequential code is easy to understand, easy to work with. How do you know you're writing code that is sequential? I'll tell you one way to know. The people at work smile at each other. That's a way to know you're writing sequential code. And you go to, uh, to lunch as a team, and everybody is happy. But then one day somebody comes to you and says, yeah, the code is sequential, it doesn't have good performance, we have to improve it. And you struggle to see how to improve it. And then somebody tells you, we can use multi-threading. What happens when you do multi-threading? I mentioned the word and one person wants to leave the room, you can see, right? <laughs> that is exactly how that works. And, and when you do this, what happens? And the code turns into a monster. And, and nobody smiles at each other anymore. And going to uh, you know, lunch together, forget about it. You got bugs to fix. And the code becomes extremely hard to deal with. And, and so as a result, this becomes progressively more difficult. And you cannot even recognize what the code was doing once upon a time. And you look at this code and say, what was this supposed to do in the first place? You're not sure about this. And what do you do? You come to work, you stay late, you debug. And very late one night, while you're still debugging that code in multi-threading, you applied for this other job. That's called concurrency. And you said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore, isn't it? Well, the good news is, in the functional style, if this were a collection which is really large, what you could do is you can take this code and you can simply turn this into a parallel stream right there. I call this the master switch. So as a result, if this collection was really large, you can go from a sequential execution uh, to a concurrent or a parallel execution really quickly without much difficulty at all. So one of the benefits you get out of this approach is that structure of a sequential functional code can be the same as a structure of concurrent functional code. When the code structure is the same, it becomes easy to understand, easy to reason, and then when you need performance, you can get up the performance and get the performance out of it. So that becomes a lot easier to work with. Well, this is great. I'm going to say that we need to really rethink about what we do. And I'm going to say that JavaScript had it right all along. And C Sharp really went that direction, and Java is trying to catch up. And that is, we've been focusing a lot on multi-threading, but really the essence is, moving forward, asynchrony is going to be really, really important. Especially in the world we live in, with microservices and cloud computing, we really want to focus on asynchrony, not as much on parallel computing. When it comes to asynchronous, how does the code structure look like this, uh, look, look in the future? Well, the good news is we can achieve some kind of uh, improvement on that front as well. Let's take a look at what that would mean. So let's say for a minute, this is JavaScript, and I got a compute function, which is sequential, and I have a compute async, which returns a promise. But I'm going to make a call to that function, and I'm going to call the compute function. Don't worry about what it does, but it's going to return some result. And I say, make the request. When the result comes back, I display the result right here. If there was an exception, because exceptions are imperative style idea, I'm going to print the exception right now, and I make the call to this particular function. But if I execute this piece of code, you can see it said compute call. And it's a blocking call. You call it and wait for the call to finish. And then you say make the request, and then you print the result of it. But of course, blocking calls doesn't give us performance. You want the calls to be non-blocking. 
So how do you make the call non-blocking? Let's copy this code right here and paste it right here. So right now, both the pieces of code are exactly the same. I'm switching between those two. But going back to this, I'm going to call the compute async rather than calling compute. This is returning a promise. Obviously, the result is incorrect. It says promise pending. But I want the result of this function. So what am I going to do? I'm going to mark this function as async. And then, of course, I can come in here and say, await the result. But when I run the code this time, notice made the request comes first, and then the uh, uh, compute async called comes after. And the reason for that is line number five is a non-blocking call. We went straight to line six after that. But the result is the same. But here's the difference between the two pieces of code. We went from an a imperative style code to an asynchronous <coughs> imperative code. And that is one of the biggest benefits we can get. The code structure is still exactly the same. So where we can get to this really is the fact that when it comes to uh, writing code in this style, the structure of synchronous imperative code can be the same as the structure of asynchronous imperative code as well. And if asynchrony is so important, I can bet you that it's going to be, then we don't have to compromise. We don't have to run to functional style just because the code structure is so different. We can gain that in the imperative style code too. And what if we can achieve this in both imperative and functional style of coding? Where would that take us? Let's think about that a little bit further with another example. So here, I want to bring in Kotlin. And I want to say I'm importing the Kotlin coroutines right now. I have a, 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 a task one. And the task one, I'm saying entering task one and exiting task one. So all I'm doing is just entering this function and exiting this function. That's all I'm doing. And I'm going to write another function, which is called task two. And all I'm going to do is say entering task two and exiting task two right now. But what I want to do in this case is I'm going to say run blocking. I want to wait for the task to be finished. I'm going to call task one right now. I'm going to call task two. But then I'm going to output right here. Let's say called the two functions. Uh, and then from, and let's go ahead and print out thread dot a current thread. So we can display that information. This is going to be absolutely a sequential execution. No surprises over here. So when I execute the code here in Kotlin, you can see it entered task 1, exited task 1, entered task 2, exited task 2. And then, of course, it says, call the two functions from thread, main thread. All of them are executing in the main thread. But what I can do, though, is I can turn these calls into non-blocking calls. And what I can do to make this non-blocking is I can simply say launch over here. And I can simply say, don't block and wait. Just go ahead and fire up the calls and run them. And that becomes a non-blocking call. So what that means is it's not going to block and wait on this. It's not going to block and wait on this. It's going to first tell us call the two functions. As you saw a minute ago, notice the call the two functions is the very last in the output, as you can see right in here. So the last line is call the two functions. That's what came at the very end of this. But what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go ahead and put the launch over here. Now when I run the code, notice what just happens here. In this case, the call the two functions is the very first thing because we are in non-blocking. But this makes something even more exciting. You get to choose between parallel and concurrent. Now, there is a lot of confusion about what is parallel and what is concurrent. What does that mean? Let's think about it for a minute. Would you be uh, 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 volunteering to help me with this? It's OK. It's pretty safe. OK. What's your name, sir? Thomas. Thomas. Pleasure. Come on over. Let's just walk a little bit. Well, this is parallel. He is walking, and I'm walking. He is taking steps, I'm taking steps. That's parallel. How are you doing? Fine. <laughs> you have a good day? Yeah. Well, was the traffic really bad getting here? No. You had a good time? Yeah, I had five minutes to walk. Uh, five minutes walk. That's awesome. Yeah. That's concurrent right there. We didn't speak over each other. We're pretty civil. That's awesome. <laughs> so I asked him a question. He answered back. And I asked a question. He answered back. We didn't speak at the same time, but I didn't ask him all the questions for him to answer all the questions. We interleave between each of us. So we walk parallelly, but we talk concurrently. Thanks, you. Thanks, Thomas. Give me a hand. Awesome. Thank you. So that's an example of parallel versus concurrent. So parallel is where two things are happening exactly at the same time. On the other hand, concurrent is we are both making progress, 
I'm asking a question, he is answering. I ask another question, I speak, he speak, I speak, he speak. While we both are speaking concurrently, but we're not speaking parallelly. But you get to make the choice. And in this case, I can make this code concurrent. How so? All I'm going to do is to go to this task one and say, yield for me. Just like I asked a question and I yielded for Thomas. And what did Thomas do? He answered it and he yielded back to me. And so we were concurrent because we both were civil by yielding for each other. So now when I run the code this time around, how does it feel to execute this code? So when I run the code, sure enough, call the two functions came first. But notice, I entered task one, but I did not exit task one. And instead, I entered task two. So this main appears to be in three places at the same time, isn't it? So the main entered task one, and the main entered task two. Then it exits task one, and it exits task two. And that is an example of concurrency. It's concurrent because the main thread is doing a little of task one, and then a little of task two, and then a little of task one, and a little of task two. Just like in the airspace, I spoke and you spoke and I spoke and you spoke. We were concurrent sharing the airspace. So we're not trying to talk over each other. We were pretty civil for somebody who has never met before. And, and that is exactly what this is doing, is that it's just interleaving between these calls and you can implement concurrency. Or you can go parallel if you want to as well by simply delegating the launch to a completely different thread and it can run in a different thread parallelly as well. It's a choice you can make. But these kinds of tools give us the leverage to implement based on what we are trying to do. And we can fine tune this based on what we are trying to achieve with this. So as a result, when we sit down and program, we can use functional and we can keep the structure the same and go parallel with it. Or we can write code in a synchronous manner and we can keep the structure of the code the same and we can go really with uh, asynchronous communication too. Now, obvious question is, we saw how to do this in Java. We, we, we saw how to do this in Kotlin. Hey, what about languages like Java? Well, this is one of the things I'm going to bet my money on. Java is going to be huge on this. And one of the things I'm really, really looking forward to is Project Loom. With Project Loom and Fiber, we will be able to do something very similar to this in Java not too long from now. And, and fibers are lightweight threads. And fibers as lightweight threads are much more efficient than creating the threads in the thread pool. And, and fibers can give us this context switching. And what I showed you here in Kotlin is something you can do very easily with the project Loom and continuations and fibers. Continuations are data structures that give us the ability to save the context of a call and come back and resume that call at a later time. And, and with continuations and fibers available in Java not too long from now, we should be able to do asynchronous programming very effectively in languages like Java as well. And, and all of a sudden, the asynchronous programming will become mainstream. And one of the things that excite me is, you know, a lot of these ideas are not new. I remember reading these ideas as a very young uh, person. But all I could do back then was only read about them. Because the languages that implemented those esoteric ideas, as it appeared to be back then, were not available in mainstream languages. But today, what we have is uh, availability of all those features in the mainstream languages. And, and that is one of the most exciting things, is these concepts that have been around for a very long time are finally becoming mainstream. Part of the reason for that is the business demands have changed. And these people were visionaries when they created this 40, 50 years ago, knowing that one day the world will demand some of these ideas. So these are becoming mainstream and, and a common place for us to benefit from, and that is pretty awesome. So languages that we use should enable and not limit our form of expression. And that is one of the key things I expect from languages is the ability to program in these different options without being forced one, one way or the other. When languages can enable us, the power is to us, the programmers. So in that regard, I see languages as more like a hydroplane. Yes, I do want to cover a lot of distance with them, but that doesn't mean I have to be in the air all the time. It could also be on, on, the, on the water surface. And so what if we think about languages a little differently? Maybe 
imperative versus functional is more like a thermostat. And it's never comfortable in a room, isn't it? There are times it's too cold or too warm. And what do you do? We can complain about it or we could tweak the thermostat. And maybe you want to just wind it all the way to the left and you want to write your code imperative. Or maybe you want to wind it all the way to the right and um, code it functional. Or maybe I want to leave it right in the middle where I'm comfortable. And I can pick and choose this based on what I'm trying to do rather than being forced one way or the other way. And what if my language is give me the thermostat and I can I adjust it to the right level where I'm comfortable. And today maybe I want it a little cooler. Maybe tomorrow I want it a little warmer. Depending on what I'm trying to do, I could vary that and, and get the power of being able to do this. You know, I've been wrong, like I said, and I'm willing to reconsider that. But progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything, said Bernard Shaw. And I'm not trying to say that we have to be whimsical and we have to change everything we hear. But I think it's important. What's the purpose of learning if we're not willing to change our opinions and our uh, observations about things? And, and one thing I've realized over time is the following. That wisdom is to realize that there are no absolutes. And saying that there is absolutely one way to do, and that's the only right way to do, I think is a, is, a, is a big problem for us if we were to be convinced about it. And so in conclusion, I would emphasize wisdom is realizing that there are no absolutes. Hope that was useful. Thank you.